Welcome back to the Exxon Zinger Show. This is episode number 226. That's 226. Welcome back to the show. For those of you that are tuning in for the first time and watching via the YouTube, give me a like and subscribe. For those of you guys who have been here before, just stare ahead into blank space because nothing really matters. For those of you guys listening via the podcast app, leave a five-star review. You know how far that goes. And for you guys who have been around through the podcast app, just stare again into the deep space, wondering exactly where you ended up here and why I have you or why you have me playing through your earpieces. Apart from that, hope you guys are doing well, hydrated, rested, lubricated, and all that malarkey. Um, hope you've applied some Vaseline on your lips, some moisturizer on your elbows, and in between those little dirty fingernail cracks that you've got all over your hands, and that you are, if not recovering, on the way to recovering through a hectic party weekend or whatever else you've been getting up to. I, for one, have been on the old uh, agua, you know, the old water for the most of the time, um, which is a bit of a change from the previous week's adventures but as always as most great philosophy will tell you um a good life is a balanced life right knowing the limits of um, excess is good and no and being able to actually rein yourself in without somebody else reining you in is always very um honorable and something a skill that you probably only learn the older you get you know the ability to kind of like look at yourself through maybe a third through, yeah third person you know like on the call of duty games when you're like standing no, Call of Duty is first person, but you can have a view that's sort of like third person. Um, that is how you want to look at your life. You want to analyze yourself from there or from like a, a drone sort of fashion, right? And see where you're going, see the pitfalls, and then be like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. But sometimes there are occasions where life is just more fun when you just take that right corner, right? That right corner that leads you right into trouble where you know you're going to fuck up or you know you're going to have to you know, explain yourself. It might spice things up a little bit, but for the most part, it's best that you are able to rein it in so for you guys are out there feeling a bit rough and having a bit of a headache i do not despise you um i do not envy you and i hope that your head is pounding up until tuesday and that you make the necessary changes that you need to make in order to make sure you live a successful and fruitful life um i've actually been binging on some random videos that i found on youtube recently of a youtubers who have been going through recovery right so the people that kind of make those videos and like oh you know i was going through so many problems and i quit everything and now look at me i look amazing and yeah fair enough there's a lot of dudes that look really cool right they look amazing they look really great and i'm happy that is the case but there's this guy in particular who kind of really scared me a little bit <laughs> let me see if i can get him up on the screen but it's a quite a cool little subculture right of these um recovery um addicts on youtube kind of being really forthright and putting themselves out there because you know i'm sure those kind of things aren't very fun they're not something that you want to kind of publicize it's something that you probably keep close counsel to your friends and family but for the most part seeing as um youtube is that place for or everything and anything i'm not surprised it's happening so this one dude that i kind of stumbled upon who had, who had no idea who he was prior to kind of you know uh checking out some of the stuff on the old uh, tube of you all right was this dude here let me see if i can get him up quickly um this guy called mod son right i'm not sure if you guys have heard of him or you know who he is but supposedly he used to go out with bella Fawn, um who's you know all over the internet these days but this dude right has kind of well old, let, let me I let me try and mute him yep yeah, well Started yeah let me try and pause him so anyway he goes through his entire video and he's essentially kind of talking about his addiction right the stuff that's kind of occurred what's going to gone on but the troubling thing about it you know the, the the setting is quite troubling but you know it's quite cool because he's in supposedly a jim morrison hotel jim morrison famous of the doors famous you know um who died tragically i think at 28 too i think it might be part of the 28 club jim morrison but anyway it's an, it's an amazing room that supposedly jim morrison stayed in back in the day in la it's kind of plastered with graffiti all over it and i think for the most part it's like an addict shrine right so i think if you're an addict or if you're a bit off the rails you probably go to la find jim morrison's room and decide to like you know do lines of amphetamines all over the bed and shit maybe similar to what people do when they go to pablo escobar's grave and they slip lines off of it so maybe it's one of those kind of stuff but anyway um the room i'm assuming has now been turned into some sort of rehab facility or whatever maybe because i wouldn't think a former addict would want to go to a room that you know might have some residue of drugs in it but he's in this room it looks fairly cool he's doing all the malarkey but then he sits down and talks to the camera right and it's a fairly cool interview i think i'll link it in the show notes if you guys want to kind of listen to it yourself but the scary part of it is this mod son dude is the same age as me 
<laughs> that's the scary part right so obviously you know i'm sure this dude has he's probably lived 17 lives right he's had an amazing time he's done all the things that he wanted to do in life he's you know uh, dated the hottest women he's worn the most expensive garments flown to the most luxurious places right he's been in the places that everyone dreams of being in but in terms of what he looks like physically like he looks like a bag of balls in it like this guy's the same age as me the same age and if, and i think there are times in life where you probably need to pull yourself back just when it's about to get crazy and maybe he's pulled himself back just when it was about to get over the edge right he could have you know this could have been a tragic case of you know all the other number of entertainers who kind of fall by the wayside but luckily he was able to pull himself back but this is what kind of it didn't scare me into anything but i just it's, it's funny whenever you're thinking about something yourself you tend to stumble upon that thing anyway it's, it's kind of like a reaffirmation of what you're thinking about and i guess i was just thinking about it in general and like how ridiculous it is sometimes to be in a space where you're surrounded by kids who are like half your age going through experiences that you went through 15 years ago right and then you're there right just like cramping up the space i, I kind of imagine it like imagine um imagine your cool uncle happens to like pop by the bar that you're in as well with your friends right it's your, it's your cool uncle you don't mind him right but he's in your space now it's a bit awkward even if you don't mind hanging around with him and having a couple of shots he's still in your space so that's i imagine it must be like if you're a kid kind of experiencing Dawson, New York, LA, um, wherever else, Paris, Berlin. If you experience the place for the first time and you just happen to have, you know, loads of old fogies like myself and other people hanging around just, you know, crusty in a corner. And yeah, I think Motsun is maybe a good example of it. It might be a bit mean to say, but you know, again, he's he's in recovery mode now. He's doing fairly well, it seemed, by the lack of it. And again, it's a, it's a pretty cool video. It's very in-depth, very raw, very personal. It's about 46 minutes long, so I recommend you check it out yourself. I'm not going to play the entire thing on this podcast now, but yeah, a very interesting video. So for those of you who are feeling bad about yourself, probably don't watch it today. <laughs> maybe watch it on Monday if you want some <laughs> motivation, whatever it may be. But yeah, a very interesting video from this dude called Motsun. Again, I'm not, I'm not very familiar with Motsun. I don't really know... Um, what they do or what they get up to and stuff like that malarkey and um, i think they're, they're probably a really successful group aren't they for the most part i'd imagine so let's have a quick little google and see how popular this mod sun group is i'm assuming or he is he's really popular i'm assuming right? isn't it i'll oh, say mod sun is this separately so mod sun according to wikipedia uh derek smith known person as mod sun is an american rapper author rock musician and poet from blooming Ten Minnesota, yeah. From a small town. Went to the big lights in LA. Not surprised he lost himself a bit. Blah blah blah. Um, he's born, yep, so the same age. And um, what else about him? Music career, he's got loads of albums out. Nothing about okay, n- not not that much about him. He's he's written a couple of books too, which is quite cool. So he wrote what he had a non fiction book in two thousand twelve, a poetry book in two thousand fifteen, and a couple of journals. That's nice. So yeah, fairly accomplished lad looks like a bag of balls but he's now putting himself together so again big up mod son great video very um raw and honest and let's see what happens now going forward did their relationship have some sort of rocky past because there's a video here of bella fawn talking about her ex-boyfriend let's see what that's about actually what's bella fawn talking about here so it's weird isn't it? talking about, about um, in public let's see ex trying to turn into a fucking 50 cent all of a sudden trying to get money off of you i'm like what the fuck so how do we get your shit out of this place <laughs> <laughs> it's what? Yeah, that's, yeah it's a long one <laughs> like just leave it just, <laughs> i know like, fuck yeah. uh, there's, well you know my computer was definitely my computer and my passport um i just recently missed um this big work opportunity I had to do because of this passport situation and uh, I needed my script writing computer back that was man that's it in it for millennials really isn't it that's your that's your key possessions smartphone laptop tablet of choice and a passport that's really all you need essentially if your house or your apartment up went up in flames that's the only thing you'd really be caring about you'd be bothered about really in general wouldn't it be your computer your passport <laughs> and your phone of some sort even the phone probably you could probably do without the phone because you've got everything on the cloud you could you know again it's going to cost you an arm and a leg i know but if you had if i had to choose between my phone and my laptop i'd probably burn my phone right you could probably get back and up up on your feet with a couple of samsung's you know in between but that's essentially all you need so imagine it, it being all in your ex-boyfriend's house and you can't get a hold of it and you're an actress or you know a screenwriter part-time i'm guessing better for because she's talking about her uh, script writing computer 
which is quite a cool idea, really. That means you don't have any distractions, you don't have any other apps that you're using. But yeah, um, I'm, I'm guessing it's a very tumultuous experience. Let's see what else she has to say about this because it doesn't seem that bad, really. It's really hard to get stuff from people's houses, even if you don't, if, even if you didn't date someone, it's hard to get something from someone's house. If you've ever been to a house party and you forgot something and you tried to get it from your friend, it just takes ages. So imagine if there was love involved there and swapping of saliva. It's going to be even more difficult. That was a big one, but all the rest of the shit, I mean, there is this spending code that I just love. <laughs> There's a spending code, but the rest, I'm just like, uh, it's really the main, the compu- the script writing, I mean. I'm finishing my series, like I, you know, I mean my it's final draft. What it's, you it's, your, it's your work. It's it, it's my computer <laughs> and my password <laughs> and my wallet. <laughs> I need it back, <laughs> please. So funny. God I, damn, man, she's got an ugly laugh in it. Mamma mia. <laughs> ex burned all of my shit. Oh my goodness, all of my shit, including all my baby photos. Wow, like, you motherfucker! But your that's... baby photo. Fo- Oh my no, baby your baby, baby photos? Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's, what the fuck? <coughs> well, <coughs> that was a very, um, what do you call it? Enlightening conversation, wasn't it, for the most part? <coughs> Not really, but hey, what can you do? When girls get around and start gossiping, it just sounds like absolute cack, doesn't it? Like, what is that? Oh, you burnt my school photos. I was like, um, all right. Fair enough. Riveting, riveting news there, ladies. But yeah, um, I'll link that mod sun video in the show notes for you guys to check out. But let's move on. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Topic number one. Skepta's got a new pair of Nike Air Maxes out and I'm a big fan. So I think these are coming out next week. I think the 12th, right? What is the 12th? Is that Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday? What is that? The 12th is... Thursday, as per usual. Most shoes drop on a Thursday right now. They don't really drop on Fridays anymore. So they're coming out on um, next week, Thursday, a pair of Nike shorts. I think this is his, Skepta's fourth collaboration. I'm pretty sure it's a fourth. We had a couple 97s, Tailwinds, and these. I'm pretty sure this is the fourth one. TNs, 97s, Tailwinds, and these, right? I'm pretty sure. So each model, oh, that's quite cool. He's, had, he's been able to go into the archive of each model or each Nike archive and kind of bring them back to life which is quite cool to see um these are the ni- new Nike shocks they're the I don't think these are an archive model because I'm pretty sure the old shocks you only have the shocks at the back so I'm pretty sure it's a new model they brought out um we first saw these on the runway I think last season or a couple of seasons ago with Comme de Garçon they did a pair where they've got like a little gold chain going over it similar to those kind of Gucci sneakers everyone wears so yeah pretty cool shoe Maybe not the most London of shoe because I always get the feeling whenever Skipper does a collaboration with Nike they do have a good synergy in terms of like pulling something out from the archives that's kind of tied into the kind of UK drum and bass, UK garage culture. I don't really see how Nike shocks are because I remember when I was in school, Nike shocks weren't the most coolest trainer to get. They were really expensive. I think they're 150 or 160 at the time. So, which, you know, most trainers back in those days were topped out to about 110. Those were 95s or 120 for 98s or 90 or 97s, right? But Nike shocks were mostly reserved for, in my school, personally speaking, were mostly worn by like breakdance kids, right? So, like, mostly Asian dudes, Filipino dudes loved Nike shocks. Um, and then I think there was a time and period where there was a lot of kind of like Jamaicans in Brixton used to wear shocks as well because they were. You know, these days are big chunky shoes you could wear with massive jeans, but he did, he, they weren't really a cool shoe. You didn't really see kids wearing them in the, in your area, right? Everyone wanted to wear kind of 90s, 95s, TNs and stuff, but not really shocks for the most part. So I'm surprised he kind of pulled these out. But again, I'm a big fan of them. I think they look really good. So that I have not seen them in person, so I'm not sure how they feel because a lot of these Nike shoes, they look quite, they photo really well, but when you see them in real life, they kind of have that weird banana boat thing. They kind of sp- bulge out towards the sides it just doesn't sit right so i'm really interested to see what these look like in actual person um again stacked so it, it kind of follows the route which we're going in for most shoes nowadays everything's sort of like a, with a thicker sole um i'm interested to see when the when the kind when it kind of goes because it always goes, goes in cycles right we go from chunky to slim but it's we're interesting place now because for the most part we have loads of chunky shoes with really slim uppers and I, I could just think of like you know dr martin's being a good example the Jaden boot's got a massive chunky sole, but the top of it, the upper, is still the same. It's not. There's no padding on it, um, no liner, no collar protection. It's just completely one piece of leather. Um, so you see a lot of shoes do the same sort of thing. So a chunky sole with a really slim upper top, which kind of you know gives that great little contrast. But I'm interested to see when it kind of flips back, and we go to like 
we start going to maybe vulcanized shoes maybe slim a little little bit more of a return back to the whole kind of conventional band old school kind of model shape or converse one stars which you only see really skaters wear for the most part you don't really see regular people where everyone's trying to wear like really chunky shoes for the most part which you know again i'm not i'm not that opposed to but these shoes are really, really cool come in black and red no two colorways which it makes the buying decision a lot easier um and this is on end so they're going to come out and they're like what one seven one seventy nine dollars so i'm assuming they're going to be 170 pounds probably right at 180 it's a lot of money man god damn but they look really nice i like them black and red let's see here the sole the sides looks really cool this is the instep i'm assuming right so you got a black upper with a metallic swoosh on both sides they sort of got the same sort of webbing you'd see on the tn so i'm assuming this is a new shock this isn't like a shock that came from the archive i'm pretty sure the shocks always have like the springs at the back only but i could be wrong so if you know correct me in the comments but i'm pretty sure this is a newer model but yeah so fairly i like the the tread as well on the bottom really really oh you know i also like the tread which is a good um sign this is what i didn't like on the what are they called what are those cactus flower print shoes market thing oh cactus what are they called rejuvenates air tailwinds let me see if i can find them i so hopefully i can show you guys what i mean but there's a reason why i did oh the vapor max that's it nike vapor max right nike vapor max so the vapor max are quite popular i see a lot of kids wearing them nowadays um or especially in my area like everyone's wearing these shoes sort of like tns with the bubbles underneath right but the reason why i don't like them and maybe it's because i've got big feet but basically the the bottom the bubbles in the bottom of the shoe sort of like um they sort of squeeze in on the side so when you're looking at them from from below you can't really see the bubbles it just feels like you're floating which then leads to your foot kind of like bulging out on the sides if you get what i mean so i'm going to kind of get the shoe up here and you see so you see that bit there that sort of like sinks in this bit here just underneath the just by the sole it sort of like dips back in there again so you can't really see it from the top i'm not sure if that makes any sort of sense but the reason why i say this is because this on these skeptical shocks if you see the bottom of the shoe where the tread is the springs are essentially um kind of outside of the side of the shoe so what you see when you get when you look down is like a nice kind of like staggered pyramid sort of like silhouette similar to the Balenciaga triple that I have so they will look amazing in real life I think in person J -j judging by what I've seen no banana thing at the front really flat which is cool doesn't point up like it did back in the day with the other rubbish tooling um so it says in the following Joining forces once again with undisputed figurehead of the modern grime, the American sportswear giant teams with skeptical for this pair of shock TLs. Um, what's the writing here say? Let's quickly read this. Numbers of gram, see, da, da, da. First seen on the feet um, in the bullet from my gun video, the sneakers finished in the British. Oh, that, that came out a long time ago, isn't it? So, shit. So, this is probably during the same time as the Comedy Garçon um, collection, then. Fair enough. Um, in the British artist's signature combination of black and red. Is that a signature combination? Black and red? Not sure about that one. Um, and stray and stray true to the OG form in contrast to the previous collaboration Air Mac models. Uh, wearing a grand fillet all black upper with a disruptive metallic silver swoosh, lightweight textile <laughs> disruptive like that. A disruptive metallic swoosh. That is a very <laughs> clever use of words, isn't it? Absolutely means absolutely nothing, but you know you all suddenly want that shoe now. Lightweight textures, mesh combined with a synthetic supportive cage while underfoot, all support shock cushioning gets dressed in striking university red, giving the early 2000s technology the attention it deserves. Finishing the look, the typical Nike uh, tongue branding has been uh, replaced with SK Shock, a respectable nod towards the grammar suit under the which is cool to see, man, because I think back in the day with collaborations, the box would never say the person's collaborate. It would just say like, you know, tier zero. It would never say the name. You'd only get the name on the actual shoe or sometimes you wouldn't get it on the shoe. So it's cool to see that they're giving these artists the ability to kind of change the label, change the actual wording on the box. It kind of makes it a little bit more special. And I think, you know, if you're if you're an artist and you've kind of got collaboration, then you'd be able to change not just the colorway, but the entire branding on the shoe. It, it, it must feel good. It must be like a really good accomplishment. Um, again, from the top. See, oh, see what I mean about the, the springs? Um protruding from the sides this is a mark of a great shoe i think this is going to look impressive in, in real life like, that looks really cool i like that man it looks amazing again i'm not sure how popular it's going to be with um, the general hype piece consumer because again it's not your typical safe model it's a bit hard to wear um again the the, the, the irony with these sort of shoes that are harder to wear is that you know this is the this is basically encompassing what 
actual sneakerheads are meant to. This is what sneakerheads, sneak, being a sneakerhead is about, really. Buying shoes like buying shoes like this that no one's really into, and then sort of making them look cool. But unfortunately, you know, nowadays, or from most, even back in nowadays time, in my time too, people just waited to see what the cool thing was and just bought loads of them. But I can't. I can't see this not selling out, and if it doesn't sell out anyway, I just assume, you know, all it takes is one ASAP rocket to wear, and all of a sudden it's completely gone, so um, I think congratulations to Skepta for the shoe in general, it's a really, it looks really cool, I'm assuming there's going to be loads of clothes coming out of it too, it'll be a waste of opportunity if they didn't do that, so I guess keep an eye out for that on all places, but yeah, it's coming out on the 12th, so this Thursday, for most of your cool shops that you go and buy your stuff from. So just go check out Drop Date for the most part. That's what I use. I use DropDate.com, but there's other websites you can use to and find the links for you to purchase. What else we want to talk about here? Um, bah, bah. Let's get that off the screen. So, what else we got next on the list here? Let's wrap up through some topics. No photos on the dance floor. Three decades of Berlin club culture. Uh, th this is a fairly cool. I stumbled across this recently because I want to visit some exhibitions when, I, when I'm over there soon. And there's this really cool exhibition called Free Deck, or it's called No Photos, No Dance Floor. And I think it profiles loads of really influential Berlin club photographers, club photographers, excuse me, who have kind of dug into their archives and taken pictures from, you know, the, the onset of the whole clubbing revolution in 1989, which might have corresponded with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Don't quote me on that uh, until the present time. And the pictures are super cool. I'm going to run through some of the images and some of the things now. This is from the British Journal of Photography website. We'll just quickly go through it now. Um, three decades of club culture. And as you can see already, you've got a really cool picture here that's from the 80s, I think, this picture is taken from. No, 1992 by Wolfgang Tillmans. Again, a very um, famous Berlin-based uh, contemporary artist. I think he's still in Berlin, but he has loads of exhibitions here in London. You'll be familiar with him if you type his name into YouTube. He's got some great lectures, some great coffee table books. Um, he even releases records on Dick's Cog as well, so he's fairly immense in the culture. A real a real big figurehead in the scene overall. He's got this amazing picture of these two dudes sitting up against a wall, one arm against the other. One's wearing an amazing old pair of, like, I'm going to say Air Spans. I think they're Air Spans. I'm going to say Nike Air Spans. They look like Nike Air Spans to me, but I'm not too sure. Just correct me in the links if you know. The other guy's wearing a pair of Dr. Martins. And the other dude's wearing just for training checks. I think. I think those are feelers. I think so. I'm not too sure. But yeah. But the most interesting part of it is the dude's earrings. The jewelry is amazing. The guy in the sea cap. So he's got this really chunky, sort of like clamshell looking um, rings. A massive nose ring. And then a massive kind of earring. And, and one that goes at the top of the earlobe. Really, really cool. Again, it's really funny when you look at these pictures because this stuff could completely look like, you know, it wouldn't look out of place if it came, if you fast forwarded it or brought it forward into the um, nowadays culture because everyone's sort of like taking inspiration for that sort of style. But this is, yeah, a little exhibition in Berlin. I'll quickly read the copy and then we can move on. It says here, no photos on the dance floor is a new exhibition opening in Sea Berlin that charts the evolution of Berlin club culture. Uh, from the fall of the Berlin Wall to the present day, or oh, I was actually in 1989, Felix Hoffman, a chief creator at CEO, a courtesy of Berlin, moved to Berlin in 1997. As a young art history student, Hoffman recalls pinning a schedule to the inside of his apartment door during the breaks of his studies. That's just a common story you know, of all kind of, you know, <laughs> creative types that go to like great cities, isn't it? Like, you know, all your hopes are pinned upon this one location and you tried everything. There is something about that, isn't it? Like the idea of going somewhere at that sort of age and having so much expectations attached to it that you're just willing it into existence, right? Sometimes you go to a place and it's not even as good as you think it is, but because you've made such a big deal out of it, you just have to make it work. There's no other way. It, can, it can't go any other way. It's just going to have to make it work. Um, that kind of innocence you can't really buy. Uh, um, it, it continues. Um, it, the schedule detailed different club nights happening all over the full coming week. It reminded me where to go on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, he remembers. This was the time when clubs only opened once a week or every second week. It was a secret system and it was an important experience for me when I was younger. No first on dance floor. A new exhibition is curated by Hoffman and guest curator Heiko Hoffman. The charts evolution of the Berlin Cup culture, beginning on the forward Berlin Wall. Okay, he's repeating the same thing again and again. I would not have co created this exhibition if it had not been for the personal experience of a young student, he says. We've got an amazing picture here of Peaches, another kind of Berlin legend from back in the day. And someone that a lot of people owe a lot of, you know, she, she someone that kind of gets overlooked in the terms of what we see nowadays, electronic music scene from Robin to Charlie XC. Um, to even um, what's her name? That girl's always complaining about her weight online. 
Binks Republic, or whatever their name is, um, maybe even Az- Azelia Banks, Azelia, Iggy Azalea, maybe one of those. They all kind of owe a lot to Peaches. You paid away for those, for that kind of like freak, um, performance freak in that regard. Like she reinvented herself a million times, loads of different sounds, loads of different collaborations, and has relatively been able to kind of stay away from, you know, the main, the curse of the mainstream for the most part. A very, very underrated artist. Um, it continues. Um, the fall of the Berlin Wall pre- precipitated what is regarded by many as the last major youth culture movement in Europe to date. The end of this physical and ideological divide gave rise to a surge of creativity which manifested itself in the empty, abandoned spaces and fringes of former East Berlin. I'm not sure I quite believe about the whole like end, the last kind of big youth culture. Even you have to go to like skate parks now and see that there is youth culture still alive. There are kids that dress like each other all over the place. They're into the same sort of music, who go to the same sort of things, or into the same sort of, who watch the same sort of stuff. Like, it does exist. It's probably not as widespread as it was back in the day. It's not as, uh, it does, it's not influencing the masses as much as it may have done in the past, but that's probably because of the internet, right? Because I think if you're a kid, you can probably tap into subcultures, just look at them from the outside through videos and through snapchats and instagram you don't really need to take part in it maybe back in the day there was no other way to take part in it as opposed to like trying out for a bit right you put on a couple of pair of dcs you stuff the tongue in you put some eyeliner and all of a sudden you're a goth for a week but now you can just sort of like tap into goth scene you could tap into the manga anime scene you can tap into the computer games scene and just keep it moving you don't need to kind of participate which might be the change but i think the subcultures do exist for sure um i was just thinking the other day what about all those guys like blade and like young lean and stuff right that movement there is a particular sort of movement within central europe of kids that dress like kids that are living in london but they listen to like really weird um computer generated music right that is a scene i think for the most part the kids that wear really small night hats and love stone island and stuff that's a scene i think for the most part um maybe not the coolest but is this uh, anyway the article continues a new kind of club culture rapidly emerged forming in opposition to the structures of post-war berlin and characterized by the transient openness and new electronic music around which it formed a sense of community and exclusivity were central financial success was irrelevant the majority of the spaces remained open for just one or two days each week allowing the people behind them to attend the other nights which is one of the only things that's not a hyperbole in this sort of article is that idea that as in, you know, some places that close and, you know, some people that open and close really soon in a tight window, sometimes the people that went have a tendency to kind of, um, what do you call it, lionize the place that they were in, right? To kind of tell tales because it's not open anymore, so you can maybe invent how amazing it was. But Berlin must be the only place where some of the places that people talk about a lot and hype up actually live up to their potential, actually live up to the you know, to the folklore. It's something that you don't really see in most places. Most places, when something's been hyped up and been spoken about ad nauseum, when you finally get there, you're like, oh, this isn't that great, right? It's sort of like when I went to New York. Amazing experience, but I think because I'd been so so, um, exposed to it on the internet through the forums I was on and the videos I was watching, when I got there, I sort of like knew too much, right? You knew I was too aware of everything. Nothing was a surprise. Everything that I thought I'd see, I saw and some. Um, the only thing that was actually a real surprise that I was actually really taken aback by was when we were invited up to this amazing penthouse apartment in the middle of Manhattan because a friend of a friend had, was was doing this sort of like house sitting thing which I hadn't heard of which is another thing that kind of opened my eyes the whole house sitting thing was big in America at that time and um, loads of kids making loads of good money in the summer because a lot of the New York residents in the summer would kind of leave the city and go out state because that's when all the tourists came in, so they didn't want to, you know, be around when all the kind of tourists were around taking pictures of the Empire State Building and shit. So she got to look after this amazing loft apartment in the middle of Manhattan, and we got to see the July 4 fireworks um, from the, I'm assuming that's, where is it, what is that, coast, wherever they do the fireworks, many of them, maybe, maybe isn't it the Empire State Building, they do loads of fireworks there on July 4th, and that was pretty cool. That was something I really was surprised by, that I wasn't really expecting to see. But everything else... <laughs> Super, super, super cash, super norm. Um, anyway, it continues. Um, Yufu, Planet, Trezor, E-Work, and the first connection of WMF and Electrox. Electro emerges the legendary party spaces um, mid-early 1990s, paving the way for a new wave of clubbing in the early 2000s. Look all the names, isn't it? Influential. UFO, Planet, Trezor, E-Work. Very 
snappy cool names. We were entertaining the possibility of putting together a show about East German photography, says Hoffman. But then we thought about how the energy of the club culture system has been so important but over the tw- last 30 years. It was a kind of special feeling that was evolved, which should be visible in the exhibition. We've got some cool pictures here of a dude dressed up in latex, given that he's all... In 1991 by a guy called Til- Tillman Burbs, and then you've got this amazing picture of a of a glass mirror, a speed mirror, by this really amazing uh, photographer called George Nia Berids. I've seen a couple of these pieces of his work online. Actually, I recommend you really check him out. He's a really really cool photographer. So it's spelled G E O R G E N E B I E R I D Z E. But I'll link him in the show notes so you guys just check out. He's got some really cool photography. And this picture is so cool. It's just basically a picture of a mirror covered in speed. It's particularly smudged out. There's a wallet on the side, a pair of cigarettes, there's a, a, a Louis Vuitton bag, a smartphone, lighter, another bit of a baggie. Just essentially the the quintessential after hours sort of like situation where everyone's sitting around trying to change the world while snorting, you know, all sorts of, you know, um rancid material up their nostrils. The article goes on, but how to make it visible three decades club culture that was firstly visited documentary, blah blah. But yeah, I'll link the show. I'll link in the show notes you guys to read yourself if you want to check it out. But it looks like a fairly cool exhibition. I think it's on until um the thirty fifth of November. So no photos on the dance floor. Um Berlin nineteen eighty nine to two today. Opens at the courtesy of Berlin in September thirteenth. So that's next week Friday and runs until the thirtieth of November twenty nineteen. So definitely check it out if you're in the area. Let's move on. Dave Chappelle Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, this is an this is a dicey topic, isn't it, for all the people out there on the interwebs. So I think as most people are aware, Dave Chappelle has recently put out his comedy special. It's available now on Netflix called Sticks and Stones. I think it was in the works for a while. Um, his last special that came in a sort of two-pack, um, one filmed in the OR, one filmed in the belly room of the comedy store was, you know, impeccable. But I think Sticks and Stones is probably tops the lot of it just because it's so timely. You know, it talks about loads of, you know, current sort of like societal issues that are sort of taboo from, you know, um, trans rights to homosexuality to politics um, to conspiracy theories, to the stuff about Juicy Smoulier. Like, just some amazing, amazing jokes in there. Some really clever observations. And just, you know, Dave Chappelle being Dave Chappelle, a real master of his work and just, you know, an absolute wizard on the stage. But as per usual with these sort of um, comedy specials, they do tend to um, a little, a little trigger a particular portion of the, of the population who are intent on not being the butt of the jokes in any situation, which is something I've never really kind of got. I get the idea that stuff can be offensive and it can annoy you, but the idea that no one can take the piss out of you, that you're above joking, right? You're above reproach or you're above taking the piss out of is, hmm, don't know what it is. It's it's just not what you'd expect the internet to be, right? The, if the internet isn't going to be a place for people to troll, which I don't think it should be, right but you know i think some people out there think trolling is funny so you know it happens quite often and sometimes the trolling can be really funny but if it's not going to be that then at least we're going to be able to crack jokes right what's what's the point of us browsing and flicking our fucking thumbs up and down if we're not going to actually kid around and have a good time but of course you know they should help i'm sure was aware of this so his current way of working where he just makes a special and then kind of disappears sort of works really well right um it's sort of like the idea behind how you should use social media where you should just post what you want to post, post and dump, keep it moving, don't kind of always kind of engage with or communicate with your audience on also on all platforms, which is kind of probably goes against what someone like a Gary Vee would say. But in general, for peak creativity, in order to kind of make sure that you're um, performing at the highest level, you can't really be having that many forms of input coming in you. You need to be able to be just putting out stuff without... And you know, putting ourselves by feeling, right? Being aware of what currently is going on in the, in your life and around you, listening, feeling stuff, and then putting it out. But in terms of sitting there, listening, and reading to everything, what, what everyone's kind of go, regurgitating out there is just probably not a good way to do it. So I think Dave Chappelle's routine of I make a special, I go and tour it for you know whatever year, record it, put it on Netflix, and just completely disappear from social media or the internet is a great idea because I'm sure that the backlash will be is much more severe when you're online because you know the news is, the news cycles change quite quickly now now no one gives a shit about Dave Chappelle we're not talking about Antonio Brown soon no one will care about Antonio we just keep cycling on but this is a quite a cool interesting article that really speaks upon what's happened so this is from the Daily Mail 
It says the following. Deja Boss controversial new Netflix special gets a zero, a rare zero rating from critics. It's not really rare because they give zeros to everybody. Um, following backlash of his jokes by Michael Jackson, but fans hit back and award it with ninety nine percent approval rating. Now this is a good. This is probably a good reflection of just what public outrage actually looks like online, right? Because you hear a lot of people say it a lot when they get in trouble. Celebrities, oh, when someone's giving them advice, oh, you shouldn't listen to the minority, right? The minority are the loudest, and they, you know, whatever. The majority of people don't really care. But you don't, as a probably as as a person going through it, you don't really, you don't believe them. You probably think they're talking out their ass. They don't. The situation that you're in, you feel all the pain, you feel all the vitriol, you feel the hate coming your way. But this is an actual physical manifestation of the reality of the fact that most of the time, most people don't care. It's just a small minority of people that are always upset. And they're the ones that try and convince the rest of us to be upset too. And this Dave Chappelle Festival is a good example of it. Because there's this screenshot they put up on here. This whole article is no point in reading it because it's Daily Mail. Just gonna be, they're just going to talk about the obvious. But essentially he goes on and you know he talks about trans people. He talks, he talks about everyone gets jokes on in the whole special. Right? No one's above not getting jokes on. But the interesting part of it is the way Rotten Tomatoes dealt with it. Now, Rotten Tomatoes is, you know, again, a, a site that I'm sure most people do use in terms of getting their movie reviews and recommendations of what to watch. I tend to not use it that often not because, you know, I don't really watch enough movies to kind of justify going in and reading it. I'd rather just, like, go and find a top 10 list of best films to watch for a certain period and just watch them and start from then and kind of, you know, hone your taste over a period of time. But for people that are really obsessed with going to cinema every week, it probably is a good resource. But they started to do this annoying thing where they kind of like, um, they, I think it might be because of Star Wars or maybe Captain um, Mar- 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 Captain Amer- Marvel, whatever her name is, a Brie Lancer's movie. One, a movie got trolled by the fans. So what they've done now is that when a movie comes out or when a TV series comes out, they will only let critics review it for the first couple of weeks that it's out. So the critics will form a review and then there'll be an audience score, which is quite cool, right? Because you get to see the, the, the kind of split because most critics will hate a movie like Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise, but most audiences will like it because it's just full out action, right? So you can get an idea of what, of where you fit in. It's sort of like Moonlight. Moonlight wasn't a good movie, but it had, it was more of a, it was more the message it kind of was able to uh, broadcast to the world, right? What it kind of represented was more important than it being an actual good quote unquote movie. Um, so this Rotten Tomatoes uh, review of Dave Zappel clearly shows that for the most part, social media outrage is uh, very much um, limited to a small amount of people because the critics went out and completely panned it, right? They gave it a 30% score. In the beginning, it was zero percent. Did no one rate it? it was all got, they all got one star. So they go to kind of verify critics who review a lot of movies, and they kind of take what they they take what they say and sort of like make an aggregate, and they all scored it a zero. But then when the internet saw that, they were like, "What the fuck? We we love this. We enjoyed this um, special. I loved my ass off from the beginning to the end." And then they voted it all the way up to a hundred. Now it's averaging out to ninety nine percent, which again shows that for the most part, I think now. Most people are saying it. I think we're reaching the end, the crescendo of council culture. It's now shifting because I think we've seen enough. We've seen enough of the social justice warrior types who kind of eat their own, right? Who kind of turn on each other. Who the same type of people who are pining for Joe Biden to run against Trump so to get him out of the White House are now kind of picking and prodding at everything Biden says, and now he's problematic. They they they're unable to compromise. They're unable to. Uh, self-reflect they're unable to be rational it, everything's really like you know absolute it's always kind of you know the end of the world or things have not gone far enough so because of that i think the general public has kind of seen that you know on both sides on the right on the conservative and on the liberal side they're just all gonna be cuckoo gaga everyone's just sitting in the middle making up their own minds so then when you watch dave chappelle's comedy special on netflix you're like you know what i laughed at this i found it funny even though there were bits and pieces of it that were offensive or that made me feel a bit weird I know it's comedy. I know it's not that big of a deal. There are movies that I watch sometimes that are crap or have an awkward or cringy scene. You fast forward them if you can, right? It's no big deal. The idea that you have to... That's the thing that really gets me about this, right? You cannot like him. You can think he's not funny. You can think he's grotesque. You can think he's rude. You can think he's... um, and uh, What you call it? Unsophisticated or whatever it may be called. Or, you know, ignorant, blah, 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 blah. Whatever, whatever kind of phrase you want to pull out of the book. But... Do you actually need, does he need to like stop doing what he's doing just to make you happy? Should he just not be around anymore? Is should he not have a Netflix deal? Do you want to completely um, delete him from the history of the world? Like, what is what are the, what is the outrage about? Right, like that's the thing I don't understand. It's like 
these critic reviews aren't like oh so i personally didn't find it interesting and i found it deplorable it's more so it's a rallying cry to everyone else like don't watch this guy like we're banning him we're telling the world he is not worthy of your time and it's like who are you to tell me what i should and shouldn't watch or listen to that's the issue that i have with it. it's like we're all allowed to listen to or watch whatever we want to watch with that that's you know that's the idea of living in a free and democratic part of the Western Hemisphere. You can do and choose what you like. But for some reason, there's a small group of people, and this is exactly an example of it from this Rotten Tomatoes screenshot, right? Who have deemed some things to be appropriate and some things not. It goes, it's like, it's like living back at home again, isn't it? It's like, you, can't, oh, you can only watch certain things at a certain time. What? I'm a grown adult. I can watch whatever I want to watch. But again, Dave Chappelle probably doesn't care. He's probably somewhere in his onesie. Uh, living a life enjoying himself but yeah it's a very interesting um state of affairs like i said i think we are reaching the end of council culture i don't think people are going to be able to tolerate it anymore because you know what's left to watch if we can't watch this like nanette and those other cringy shows they have on comedy central like isn't that what else should we watch then i'd I, you know i'd love to see i'd love to see a list of comedy specials that um these critics thought were great this year right because I, I i think someone pulled up a list actually of that um What's the name? AOC documentary that was on Netflix that kind of profiled the the squad as they called those four uh, democratic women who were kind of leading the charge um, of socialism in that regard. That got amazing reviews. That I'm surprised. Well, I'm not surprised it did because you know they are who they are. But I'm interested to see what they think is a good review. These critics, but for me personally, I loved it. I thought I'm a big fan of it. Loads of crude jokes. Yeah, he joked on Louis C.K., Kevin Hart, R. Kelly, Michael Jackson, uh, Macaulay Culkin, Michael Jackson's accusers, um, T.I., Nas. Everyone got it. No one was real brother approach. I fucking love this whole thing, man. It was really, really cool. Actually, there's a clip of actually Nas um, and T.I. in the front row, actually, of one of the, one of the shows. Absolutely crying. I think there's Jar- Buster Rhymes is in there, too. So loads of great uh, celebrity cameos you see when you watch the show. But in general, a really good performance by Dave Chappelle. Again, he doesn't need my pats on the back. But again, if you're a fan of his comedy, if you're a fan of Chappelle's show and you want to, you want you know, something a bit interesting, something a bit racy, something that doesn't, you know, treat you like a baby, I recommend you check it out. It's on Sticks and Stones on Netflix now, available where you do have Netflix. And if you don't have Netflix, come on, do a bit of a Google. You know where to find that shit. You know where to find it. Okay, next on the list here, we have the Ace Family skiing in an infinity pool. Yeah. That that whole YouTube family thing is very bizarre. I, I've never really got the whole YouTube family thing. Um, I found it very creepy, um, very odd. But again, you know, I think the whole point of YouTube is to allow the regular everyday folk uh, to kind of go online and to somehow, you know, actualize their dreams, to change the future of their families, to just be on social media in general. So maybe it's not that crazy that there's a family channel out there, but I just find it weird of why you'd want to watch a YouTube family channel. Like, I don't know, like I, you know, most people don't really enjoy spending time with their own families. So why would you then want to sit on your computer watching another family live this um, uh, fake existence for the most part, right? Um, engineered for the likes and for the views, which you can not have a problem with. But again, I would. there are better ways I would want to spend my time. But that being said, um, this family is very popular. I'm not sure, sure who they are. Ace family, they're very familiar. I've seen, I've seen videos of them here and there, but I've not really watched any of their stuff. But um, this kind of gathered news on the whole interest because they decided it was a good idea to ride a jet ski in an infinity pool in LA. Now, infinity pools, you know, we're all a big fan of them. We've all been on Instagram. We've all seen that picture of that girl kind of like with her back towards us looking over the sunset in an infinity pool. We're like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's what retirement looks like, right? Or making it, quote unquote. But infinity pools are always kind of inherently cool. When you see them in person, they kind of become less cool, right? Um, because they're usually quite small. Um, they're usually really, really shallow as well for the most part. And, you know, it's not that big of a deal, right? It's an infinity pool, whatever. Um, once you've seen one certain pool, you've seen them all. doesn't really make that much difference. But these dudes decide to jet He tries to ride his jet ski, which I'm not sure how he even got in their first place, um, inside the infinity pool. And I don't, I don't know why you'd have a jet ski in your own house in LA, but I'd assume you'd have it somewhere next to the water or in a shed somewhere. But I don't know, people, maybe people put it in their garage. But the problem with this is, He's riding it inside his little infinity pool around and around in circles. And then all the water is splashing on the, on, the, on the edges. And this kid on his social media, I think on Twitter, must have tweeted a video or a picture of, I think his uncle or some one from his family lives in the houses just around it. 
and all that water that he was splashing was causing mudslides that was kind of affecting everyone's vegetations and gardens and stuff and just wreaking havoc everywhere and in true youtuber fashion um i think the wife or maybe the husband got on social media and just kind of you know was like so what we do what we want sort of thing it just made me laugh it just really did it's the sort of thing you never really would see an established celebrity ever doing right um acting with such kind of contempt for their audience but there's something that's quite particular and very specific to a youtube personality right this idea that they're you know they have no idea of how they're perceived on the outside they don't have no acknowledgement of it and you just do exactly what they want and for some reason the audience laps it up you know just look at someone like tana mongo tana montagu right if tana was a a normal celebrity that wasn't from YouTube, she would have got cancelled time ago, right? People would have been bored of that along to tell us effectively like Lynn Lena Dunham, right? If Lena Dunham was a YouTuber, her life would be much more easier. People wouldn't mind. But the fact that she's a Hollywood star, like, you know, Lena Dunham was in Once Upon a Time, for instance. No one gives a shit. Right? That's how bad that's how much she's fallen to have grace. So this is a yeah, so this is a, a article from Perez Hilton that says the following. Um East or Iran actually, which is quite cool to see. Um Ain't no shame in the Ace Family game, but there are probably should be. For those of you who aren't familiar, this family of vloggers made up of dad Austin Mc, Austin McBroom and Catherine Pies and daughters Ellie and Alia. That's a creepy bit, right? Everyone knows their daughter's names. Everyone's seen them grow up. They don't really have a choice in the matter. And if they do, so what? It's just it's such a weird exploitation of your own family, isn't it? It's very, very bizarre. Um, and what happens when the views stop? That's the issue, isn't it? Because YouTube... Um, intrinsically is a place where you're kind of chasing the views you're chasing the algorithm um what if the views stop or you have to do some questionable stuff to get your family back on you know on the trending page or get the subscriber count up where it should be that must be a disturbing place to be as a as a kid right imagine your parents are doing this but whatever um so um they've become one of youtube's most popular uh channels over the past few years thanks to their energy the telegenic personalities and yolo energy but the shenanigans that led to the bounty of clickable content has also allegedly resulted in some real life damage for their neighbor property now viewers are banding together to decree how problematic the ace family really is it started on monday night when the family uploaded an exhausting hour and 10 minute long tour of their enormous mansion who's watching tour videos of someone else's home for an hour no way unless you're jeffree star someone i don't give a shit one hour and 10 minutes to watch ace family talk about in this room this room this room just talking into an empty flat that like, people have got time on their hands time 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 and actually you know what we have time let's click this and see what what their video what the tour their film actually looks like this is is this, is this coming is this them coming out is that the ace family coming out to people why is there a basketball arena full of their fans oh my god is this how big these guys are jesus christ they're walking literally walking out to a stadium full of people a basketball arena surrounded by two big security guards and another security guard carrying their baby mama mia what is this mm. let's see what this video what's, let's see what this house looks like Woohoo! House looks fucking insane though, doesn't it? Look at the outside. Two cars, an amazing mansion. I wonder if it's a new build or something they just bought off somebody else. Probably a new build. Huh? What do you reckon? I don't know how mansions work. Not even my tax bracket at the moment, but yeah. Two palm trees on the inside as you walk up to the entrance. Slow motion of the video. Oof, looks amazing. Okay. bloody hell it's massive okay the house is massive let's get back to the alcohol wow um duh, duh, duh. besides monday when they upload 10 minutes ago, the, the crypt star video took viewers through the couple's massive pad before austin decided to show off the pool in the backyard with his jet ski much to Catherine's dismay the former college basketball star rode his way runner around the pool after a few laps a few crashed with his wife austin shopped stopped and created a literal wave pool and told the camera as he probably starts the wave runner ace family you only live once i live like i always say so why not live it up but imagine you've got a family and that's your motto you only live once like i say so why not live it up you can't have a can you can you have a family and be and ascribe to yolo is that a thing isn't yolo like hot girl summer or like whatever it's for like single people without any families right you can't really say yolo when you have a child crying in the next room shitting themselves right it's not really a thing because you can't really like that because you have to look after that kid to be able to be a functioning adult but anyway, here's a reason Austin jet ski antics have allegedly caused 
a love alarm. After the video was posted, a Twitter user called Joseph Cabrera claimed that the waves from the family's pool created a mudslide that destroyed his uncle's property and grapes. <laughs> and then that the vloggers continued to do so, despite the neighbors complaining. Imagine being a neighbor of a, of a YouTuber, right? Imagine, you remember when Logan Paul and, and his brother were living in that house, the Team 10 house? Imagine being their neighbors. The parties and the noise, like, that must be awful, isn't it? And most of these places that, you know, most of these um mansion areas or kind of gated communities in LA for the most part, outside of celebrities, if you see ever see videos of celebrities talking to their neighbours, they're always surrounded by older people, retired these, right? People that have made it and you know, in hedge funds or whatever or businesses and they just kind of want an easy, safe life. It's not really surrounded by like, you know, loads of party animals for the most part. It's all just older people that just wanna, you know, have a good time and chill out. So imagine coming back from work or coming back to your nice apartment that you've worked really hard for at the age of seventy five and you've got, you know, a family full of vloggers next door to you screaming and hollering the husband riding a jet ski the wife frantically crying in the background yeesh the aces for their part are apparently largely unbothered by the fact that they're causing the problems in other people's lives on tuesday Catherine pays took to twitter to share a string of smiling emojis when a fan asked her to elaborate she replied oh nothing people just hate to see happy people minding their own business living their life and staying in their own lane so i'm just smiling at them that that again the lack of self-awareness from youtubers reminds you a lot of footballers right have you seen an interview with um granite Xhaka from arsenal he's kind of responsible for the most you know you don't need to know about football but essentially granite Xhaka is responsible for um the most individual errors of a footballer that lead to goals right for the whole country in the whole of england this one player is responsible for making the most mistakes that lead to goals whether it's gives the ball away or he tackles somebody and it's a free kick and he goes in so he's in the interview and someone asked him about his last performance where he did get a giveaway of a penalty, which the team scored for. And he's kind of acting as if like, you know, it's no big deal. Like, so what? Like, you know, people do it all the time. And then he completely shifts the, the conversation to, oh, people weren't talking about the amount of chances we missed. That, that one interview reminded me of a YouTuber. That's essentially what YouTubers are like. Have absolutely no self-awareness at all, right? Let me see if I can find this interview. Granted, it's like a... <laughs> interview um about tackle right let's see if i can find it he has absolutely no self-reflection of the, the idea whatsoever let's see if i can find it here mm. no one talks about the whatever the, the, the yes here it goes right let me play it now for you to see this is essentially what this is essentially what youtubers do day in day out if you guys can see it here boom press number two so this is Grand Jacker. Listen to this. Of course, I put it. Um, it's always here. Um, North London Derby. I think we have a good game. I make a mistake with a penalty. Yeah. Um, but uh, if you see the game, you can win this game. We have a lot of chances. But this is football. Nobody speak about the chances. Nobody speak about how many we miss. Always speak about the mistakes. It's he didn't make a mistake. He always makes the mistake. Right? And he's saying that no one speaks about the chances. Of course they do. It's a match. But that's just a match of YouTubers for the most part. That is it. Like, oh, no one speaks about all the good work we do for the charity. It's like, no, we, we, we do speak about the charity work. It's just that you're riding a jet ski in your swimming pool and it's causing uh, an avalanche of mud to pile onto your neighbor's gardens. Maybe just stop, right? But no, it continues. Um, Of course, the critics disagreed. Fellow YouTuber Drew Godin galvanized some waves of courage uh or well, of outrage at the vlogging family with a twitter thread calling out their behavior he shared the following the ace family continually does something that is directly hurting people else's also the ace family we're just minding our business i don't think that's how minding your business works right so they got the old text thread there this is when the flood gets open soon fans started reverence about other ace family controversies by the time earlier this year when austin received backlash for showing a video on snapchat showing his two-year-old daughter licking a dildo shaped like a lollipop a living a dildo shaped lollipop jesus christ two-year-old <laughs> youtubers are fucking they don't give a shit he shared a video of his daughter licking a lollipop look like a dildo that is a madness after fans blasted the social media stuff sexualizing his kid the family announced that they were taking a break from posting content on their channel they didn't say sorry just oh we're gonna take a break all right cool man it's like when um what's his face from uh house of cards got accused of being sexually assaulting that guy and he suddenly came out and said hey guys i'm gay so like, um, i guess we kind of knew mate then last month a twitter user said catherine an instagram dm came in one of their friends slept with austin in miami and the influencer made her sign an nda 
The mother of two didn't buy that user story. Tweeting response. Oh my God, LMAO. Post your proof people want to see. How about you post what you got? And if someone tries to sue you, I'll pay for it. Deal? I swear people believe anything they read. Sigh. Sigh. Oh my God. Well, guess a couple don't want to see people believing. But yeah. Another YouTubers just being YouTubers and doing their thing. Again, I, I'm, I'm unsure as to why the audience still cares. But maybe it's a authenticity thing right even though they're, they're dicks and they act the way they do at least they're like that consistently at least you know what you're gonna get it's fairly fake but at least you know it's fake right it's unlike like hollywood actresses and actors who are kind of protected and in this kind of walled garden of silence and everything's very manufactured at least with this family you get exactly what you see on a tin right self-absorbed narcissist who have who have stopped to nothing and um, to ensure that their family is rich and famous which is you know again not a, an, an ambition that i have but something that you can't really um tell somebody else not to have everyone's got their goals and ambitions in life and if that's theirs then so be it but you know ruining someone's grapes and their gardens is a bit out of, out of order do you know what I mean? that, that that's what it causes ruckus but again i'm pretty sure as i've did logan paul and finger magic get kicked out of their house the LA lo local housing people aren't, they don't muck around. Once, you, once you've got a couple of complaints against you, they'll chuck you out of your home. So I'm sure this will probably end well for everyone else involved. But yeah, interesting story, man. Imagine allowing, sharing a video of your two-year-old daughter licking a lollipop looks like a dildo. That is next level. That is next level. But again, I don't know. I don't know. What do we know? Um, move on to the next topic here. <laughs> XOYO, no more headliners. I'm so happy to hear this news. This is great. So, XOYO in, um, what do you call it? Shoreditch or you call it Old Street? I don't know where do you call that area. But, again, one of my favorite clubs to go to in the, on the more commercial sort of end of things. Um, they tend to have a, you know, pretty sort of like, not we'll say run of the mill, but they don't tend to be as, as adventurous as other spots like Corsica Studios in London. In terms of their kind of headlines, I guess. But they do do a good job. They do a hell of a good job of doing really good, back-to-back -back sets right like when i watched um, young marco and mercy john ensemble play there a few months ago great back of back great back-to-back -back sets that complement uh, each artist so again one of my favorite spots just in general um very well organized great security bars fairly quick to kind of get a drink at um it's split over two floors great toilet use a massive cloakroom you know everything you probably need it's located in central so for the most part you can get back home quite easily and opens until 4 a.m no problem for me but it seems as if they've had a bit of an issue with booking headliners or getting the people that they want for the prices they want for the most part. Because a lot of the, I think that was a, that was a part of the debate I posted um, from the IB for Music Summit that happened a couple of months ago. There was a lot of debate between the promoters about being priced out of the market for the middle of the tier, for the middle tier DJs, right? Not the big ones, but the middle tier DJs who now think or are aware that they are as good as the top tier DJs are demanding big money. So you can't get them for a grand anymore. You have to pay them much more than that. So that's affecting how the clubs book them. So an effort to kind of combat that, London's club X Y has kind of decided not to have any headliners, right, on their Saturday night parties, which is a great, great, great thing. And instead, just have like a pleasure hood, sort of like similar to what um, Bergheim has in the club Natch, right, the club night sort of thing, where they just kind of book loads of in-house people and loads of friends of friends to kind of keep the party going. And this is an article from Mixmag that kind of stipulates here, and we can kind of talk about it later. So London club X Y no longer book a headline sets for their Saturday night party pleasure hood. Says the following: X O Y has announced that they will stop booking headline acts on Saturday series of Pleasure Hood. Uh, the longtime X O Y resident um, Jasper John or jo Joshua Joshua James, sorry Jasper John, uh, will be taking the DJ booth each Saturday with Coco Cole, Luke Solomon, Elisa Rose, and Hifi Sean also joining on rotation. Dancer Louis Fizz will also be fronting the dance trip each week. That's awesome. The decision means that the advanced ticket prices will be pushed down to five pounds. That's awesome. Um, let's see if we can. Um, da -da -da. Let's get a pleasure page to get the whole info, but that's a really, really good idea. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. An entire series is basically all in house DJs playing. Let's call it a video. Let's get this pleasure every Saturday. Let's see if we can fit some resonant voice or. But it was a pretty cool um, kind of explanation as to why I decided to do it, which I thought was worthy of giving a bit of attention because again i think it's something you're going to see a lot of other places starting to take note of um and kind of adopting in their kind of places uh so this is yeah this is an article from resident advisor that speaks about it a little bit more um 
This is the following to quote from Amixa Wire. It says, ticket prices in London are becoming extortionate and international headliners playing to thousands of people. We basically don't want our Saturday nights to be part of that problem anymore. We want our dance floor to be affordable for everyone. So five pound tickets, well, five pound stand tickets, I'm assuming going up to about 10 and stuff, whatever. So let's see the one happening next week. Um, on the 7th, how much is that going to be? Okay, all of them are sold out, basement, see? There we go. That's a great idea. So all the tickets for next couple of weeks are sold out, it seems as if. Just with Joshua James and Kimishi, those ones are available. 21st. That's a really great idea. So Joshua James is always playing in the basement and they'll rotate someone on the top floor. So again, it's just, you know, you could just you know what you're gonna get on the it says Zachary says in the team, nine to four AM. Little video here, let's play and see what they're talking about on this one. But again, a really clever idea, I think, for the most part. I think most people will be quite pleased with it, especially if you're in that sort of area and you want to party in that zone. I think it's a good, 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 good idea. Amazing. Cool video. And they've got dancers in there too to get the party going. It's like Saturday night, isn't it? In Shoreditch, I think, you know, there's it's hard to kind of get that shit wrong but again lowering the ticket entry allowing maybe more of your residents to kind of recommend their friends who they want to play and again maybe it's an opportunity for them to maybe kind of expand and kind of get out there and introduce new DJs to the scene as well kind of get that whole thing running because I think for as amazing as it is to go and see a big headline act in a place like XYL it's probably quite cool to be able to go imagine you're drinking at a dragon bar or something around the corner and you want to just go to have a dance right the ability to know that oh you're not gonna to have to pay 25 pounds to go see someone play right 15 is probably where it should be i'm assuming most places in berlin are the same right 10 euros or 15 euros 15 is probably a little bit more affordable to kind of go in on a whim 20 is when it kind of gets a bit too crazy yeah it looks like yeah for the most part anytime entry is 15 pounds advanced tickets are fiver so you could always kind of buy a couple of advanced tickets and if you don't sell them just sell them on to some friends Again, a really, really clever um, idea from the whole XOIO team. And I think for the most part, it should be a, a success. It started already. They've got them running until the end of the month or until December. So hopefully this goes well and people are kind of receptive to it because we want, we need to see more of it in the main reason, I think. Especially nowadays with the amount of clubs closing. The only way it's going to survive or it's going to be helped is if, you know, punt or the clubs are able to book people who aren't A1 headliners and customers such as you and myself or myself and you can go to these parties and attend them and also make them profitable, right? So they keep putting them on. That's the only way it can go around. Instead of just waiting for Ricardo Villalobos to come down every month, right? We should be supporting these sort of nights that are happening every Saturday and trying to make sure that they hang around for the foreseeable future. But yeah, that's new to XY. Again, I'll, I'll link the next, I think the next couple of parties that are available are the ones on the 21st, I'm pretty sure, right? The Pleasure Hood on the 21st of September, that's when it's available. Um, no, the one next week is sold out, which is mad, isn't it? That's pretty cool, man. Next week one's... Oh, no, the one just passed is sold out, sorry. Next week one's still available, right? Yeah, next week is uh, Jasper John and Coco Cole playing. Go here on the screen. £5 advance tickets, £15 for any time entry. Pleasure Hood at XOIO. So check it out again if you're in the area. I'll link it all in the show notes for you guys to check out. So that is an hour. Again, thanks so much for tuning in to the Exynos English Show, episode number 226. As always, check out the show notes for, this, for links of the show. My website, DJ Gig Listings, can be there. You can find other bits and pieces like DJ Mixes. I've got a new techno mix out. It's available on SoundCloud. Check that out. I'll put that in the show notes as well for you to see. And all the other good stuff. If it's your first time watching via YouTube, then give me a little thumbs up, a little subscribe. That'll go a long way. Any questions, put them down in a little comment section. If you're listening via the podcast app, and it's your first time, leave a five-star review. That'll go a long way. And if it's your second time, thanks for hanging on in there. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show. Take care. Peace.